Well, a very good morning to you, a very warm welcome to Christchurch, whether you're here in the building or joining us online, it's good to be gathered together this morning. Uh, you know, as I was walking, well, I wasn't walking, I was driving actually, but as I came to church this morning, it was lovely as we came towards the town to see uh, all the yellow daffodils coming out, a reminder, an annual reminder of the new life and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, for many of you, as we trundle through this term, it's, it's half term this week. Hey, so if you're on half term, give me a wave or a shout. Yay, good, brilliant. So, if you're on half term, I hope you have a lovely break. But whether you're on half term and relax, or whether you've got your nose still hard to the grindstone working hard, it's good that we come to worship together this morning. So would you please stand? And we just pray, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us in this place. Thank you that we come to you however we are this morning, with glad hearts or with heavy hearts, that you long to meet us. And so we pray that we would meet with you, that your spirit would lift our hearts to your throne. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Psalm 92 starts with these words. It's good to praise the Lord, to make music to your name, O Most High. So we're going to make music to know his name now as we sing Raise the Alleluia.
you all the way. seated for a moment. <laughs> so because it's half term, over the next two days we've got join in. There's over, well over 200 children coming to that, plus adults for the fun, the storytelling, the conversations here in this church building over the next two days. So we're going to pray for join in and we're going to pray for the children as they go out to their groups now. So let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the promise of joining over these coming days. We pray for each of those sessions, Father. We pray that you would watch over them. We pray for fun. We pray for safety. We pray for strength and grace for the leaders. And we pray that all the children and youngsters would have a great time. We pray for the conversations that will happen over coffee. And most of all, we pray for a sense that this is a place that's special through your presence and the worship of you here. So Lord, we pray that you would move through those times. And now, Father, we pray for the children and for the young people's helpers as they go out to their groups now, that you again would bless them, that they would learn of you, that those times would be uh, fun in your presence. And for us here, Father, that we would continue in your presence here. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the children and their helpers go out. If you're new, look for a helper that's got a green lanyard on. And if you're staying in church here, uh, turn to somebody perhaps you don't know so well and greet them, say hello to them this morning. Well, it's lovely to be able to see you all here this morning, especially a warm welcome to those of you as well who are joining us online. Please do continue saying hello to one another over coffee after this service. And we just got a couple of notices. The first is, please do continue to be praying for join in this week, both Monday and Tuesday, and there's another event here on Wednesday as well. So it's great opportunities for us to be sharing this space and sharing the good news of Jesus and the fun together. So be please do be praying for that. And also in your prayers, please do be praying for the bereavement course and the Alpha course that is going on at this moment in time. We also want to let you know that next Sunday is our welcome lunch. So if you're new to Christchurch or you feel like you'd like to know a few more other people here, please do come along. If you could let the office know, uh, that's really helpful uh, because otherwise we don't have to do a miracle of five loaves, uh, but we can always do that. So please do let the office know, but we'd love to see you and we'd love to welcome you and to tell you a little bit more about Christchurch and all that happens, but above all also for you to meet with other people and to connect well with them. You know, behind everything we do in this church is prayer. And so in this space today, 
we're going to be praying in a few moments. So why don't you just close your eyes for a moment. And let's still ourselves. And Louise is going to come and lead us in prayer this morning. Dear God, would you help me with the, li- the life that I live right now? Help me to value the life I live right now. Show me the good things I often overlook and help me be content with what I have. Forgive me when I compare myself to others. <clears throat> Forgive me for longing for things outside of you and your kingdom. Thank you for loving me right where I am, right as I am. Help me to keep my eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, as we come to this time now, where we reconnect with you, we pray for everybody around the world. We pray for people in all the pain and suffering and struggles of war. Innocent lives caught up in conflict, Lord. And we pray that they would be able to lift their eyes and see you and your glory and your love for them. And we pray that the prayer that that we just prayed would be true for people all over the world. In your name. Amen. And Lord, we pray for people in our country. We pray for people in our church. We pray for people known to us experiencing pain and daily struggle. Maybe it's even us as we suffer and struggle right now. We do pray that you would help us to lift our eyes to you. We pray that you would help us to choose to sing and praise your name in the storms and in the struggle. And we pray that your love would shine through for everybody here, everybody in our congregation, everybody in where and in our land. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we conclude our prayers as we pray together the words that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. So we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As we move on through our services, the service will soon be coming to the reading of scripture and the opening up of the scripture passage. And uh, we're continuing through our series on Romans. We've been following the argument through how we've all fallen short of God and how we are all rescued through Jesus Christ. We just have to put our trust in him. And our reading today is going to start with a verse that summarises that up really well. It says, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so as we move through worship to the reading of scriptures, we're going to sing again of the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Let's stand as we sing.
Holy God, thank you that it's good to be in your courts, to be gathered with your people in your presence. And we pray now that we would continue to experience your presence, your speaking to us, your ministering to us and meeting with us as we hear the scriptures read and continue to be opened up to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Today's reading is Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 15. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Father, we thank you for your word. And as we explore it now, we ask, Lord, that it will speak to our hearts and minds and lives. Help us to know the good news and help us to be able to share the good news in your name. Amen. You know, when you climb a mountain, you get to see an amazing view. And that's what we've been doing through this part of Romans, where we started at the bottom in the Valley of Sin and realized how God lifts us up and then takes us on that journey through Jesus. And we saw last week the most amazing hope that we have. It's almost like you can see the gospel in all its dimensions in, Rome, in Romans chapter 8. And yet so often when you're at the top of a mountain, it can be a bit mystery and a bit cloudy. It's almost like there's mystery surrounding it. As you start walking, you suddenly go, which way am I going? I don't quite see clearly. And at this point in Romans, we've come to chapters 9, 10, and 11. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to unpack them all now, as we'd finish halfway through a few weeks' time. But the point is, in these chapters, it really helps us to unpack the mystery of God. But they're quite hard to read and to follow. Because as in so often in parts of the Christian life, there is a bit of a tension There's a tension about how God is in charge, God is sovereign, and God is working his purposes out. But there's also the part that we have a part to play. We have free choice, we have free will, we can choose to follow or not follow. And so in Romans chapter 9, it has how the people of God have both followed and not followed. And how God, in his mercy, has given them a new start. How their choices in faith weren't dependent on because of who they were. They were dependent on following God and his voice. Putting their faith in him. And so that's the place where we come to today. Where it's God is in charge. And yet we have a part to play. That mystery is something that we often find in so many spaces. Sometimes that waiting between our prayers not being answered and being answered. Or sometimes that, why hasn't God got on and worked that peace out? It's a tension that we have to hold on to. And as Paul explores it in chapters 9, 10, and 11, he ends up just in a place of praise. Because God, you know, you love us. And despite being sovereign, you choose to use us. You choose to work through us. You choose to value us. And above all, you choose to show us mercy 
and love and grace. And the thing is, as we look at this part of Romans, we realize that this grace is available to all. It's just there. If you had a look at verse 8, just before the verses we read today, but what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. In other words, the message is just there. It's just there ready. It's so close. And you know, it's for each and every one of us to be able to hear and to respond. It is that close. It's literally about reaching out and you can just touch it. You can choose to enter into it. You can choose to do something about it. As Paul, Paul is saying, look, Romans, I'm telling you all of this. Christ Church today, I'm telling you all of this. But you have to choose. It's so close, you just have to choose and step out and touch it. You see, our part is to respond to the good news and then to share the good news. The good news is just there. The good news is available to all. That's why Paul is pointing out in the previous chapter that actually the people of God in the Old Testament point to Jesus and point on to eternal life in him. That we are all there able to receive the good news. But more than that, he talks about how we receive the good news. And there's three truths, first of all. The first is that it's not by deeds or by our hard work. It's by the resurrection of Jesus. It's by believing in our hearts that Jesus died and rose again. And it's by speaking it out. It's not something we do to earn God's love. It's not something we do to pay reparations or to sort something out. It is simply a response. We can't earn salvation. It is a pure gift of God in Christ Jesus. Have any of you here tried to raise anybody from the dead? Great. So we all agree we can't do it ourselves by our own hard work. Because we trust in Jesus and his resurrection. But Paul makes it clearer as well. It's also not by our DNA. Verse 13 talks about it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile. It's about whether you choose to follow and put your trust in him. Whether you choose to follow and place your trust in him. Whether you choose to receive God's mercy and his love and his grace. For some of us here, we may have been Christians for many, many years. We may be children of Christian parents and grandparents. We may in all kinds of ways. But what Paul says is that you still need to choose to follow Jesus. You still need to choose to speak it out and to believe in your heart. It doesn't matter who you are, that's the bottom line. So we can't earn it ourselves, we can't do it ourselves. It's not because of who we are, it is a sheer act of God's grace and our response to it. So therefore we come to the third truth. And that third truth is that we get to share it. That's our part. But just before we get to share it, I wonder how many of us have been good sometimes at saying, yeah, Jesus is Lord. You know, sometimes it's very easy for us to believe in our hearts and believe on Sundays, but actually there may well be times during the week where we'd rather hide that we were a Christian, that we don't want to share it. And we think, oh, it was far easier back in biblical times. Well, I just want to point something out to you. When Paul was asking the Romans to say Jesus is Lord, well, the only person who had the title of Lord was Caesar. And so to say Jesus is Lord in that context meant that you were likely to lose your livelihood and your life. So it's the context here of saying, actually, to believe in Jesus is a wholehearted response and a whole proclaimed response. You know, there is something amazingly powerful of that moment of proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, whether we've done it through confirmation or through baptism, it's about that opportunity to say, Jesus is Lord. 
And we sang earlier of the powerful name of Jesus. And sometimes in the mystery that we don't know what to pray, actually we can ask Jesus to act in that space. We can pray Jesus is Lord and we can pray the name of Jesus because Jesus changes and transforms. And so it is God's work to transform our hearts and it's for us to be willing to share that and to declare Jesus is Lord. Declare with your mouth, believe in your heart. So let's have a little look at verses 9 to 13. So we look to declare with your mouth, believe in your heart. Verse 10, for it is in your heart that you believe and are justified. It's an absolute transformation of the inner life. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And it is the spoken action of the truth that has happened on the inside. The two are two sides of the same coin. It is the internal truth and the spoken truth. For as scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. You know, shame is such a powerful thing. How often do we not share something about who we are because we're ashamed of what someone else might say or think? You know, we're taught it maybe even at school, where if we put our hand up and answer the wrong question in the wrong way, people look down on us and laugh at us. Or maybe we've had comments that have shamed us in different ways. You know, sometimes we're ashamed of the things we've done. Whether that's right or not, shame is very powerful and it can control our minds in so many ways. And the thing is, God deals with that. God deals with our shame. Whether it's because of our sin or just because it's something that we are ashamed of. God deals with it. Because he does it first of all on the cross. Jesus was made shame in that moment. Jesus was exposed on that cross in that moment. Jesus took the sin of the world on the cross in that moment. Why? So that you and I don't have to. You all know the parable of the prodigal son where the father immediately wraps his robe around the son and covers him. The point is the father became shamed and covered the son. That's what God does for us. God deals with the shame. He says, you are my son, you are my child. With you I'm well pleased. I'm delighted to know you. I'm delighted to be a part of your life. And you know, it's more than that. Because for eternal life and eternity, we get to be seen with God. We sang at the beginning in the presence of my enemies. We actually get to stand with God. To know God's smile and everybody else to see that we were faithful. There is nothing to be ashamed of. God gives us an identity. God gives us a purpose. And God will never let us down. God will never shame us. And as last week said, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. All of us, no matter who we are, can have a relationship with Jesus. All of us can know the presence of God with us in the everyday. All of us can know the Spirit of God living in us. And all of us can know that we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. All of us can know the blessing of God. There is no difference. Wherever we go, we can know the blessing of God. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's no space for judgment or for envy of anybody else. The space is for all who call on the name of the Lord to be shared, saved. So what's our part? What's our part then if we've received this most wonderful good news of a fresh start in Jesus? Well, our part is to share it. Just look at the argument in verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? They need to hear about Jesus to believe in Jesus. 
You see, that's the interesting piece. What we hear about God, what we know about God, what we respond to. Someone has in the past told you about Jesus. And you've been able to respond. How are you sharing Jesus with others? Because that's Paul's big imperative here. How can they believe in the one of whom they have not? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And by the way, that doesn't mean somebody up the front like me. How can they hear unless you share your life and your hope and your good news? How can people hear unless you share your story? That's why we've looked at the gospel so much through Romans. So there's a confidence to be able to share the good news that you are loved in God, that you have a new start and an eternal life. There is a God who is for you, not against you. There is a God who always loves you. And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? The reality is that each and every one of us goes to a different space this time tomorrow morning. Each and every one of us goes to a different space this afternoon. Each and every one of us gets the opportunity of sharing the hope and the good news of Jesus in many, many, many different places. Jesus himself came and lived and moved amongst us and shared the good news in the everyday places. That's how he commissions us to do it. He didn't leave a plan B. He passed it on to his disciples, who 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 passed it on to you, and you pass it on to his disciples. That's the case. That's how it is. Lived out in the power of spirit. Yes, God is sovereign, but we have a part to play and a part to share. And a pure joy in sharing the Lord and actually that delight in seeing people grow and change in him. So what does that mean a little bit more? Well, 1 Peter tells us to always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have. How many of you have thought about the places in which you are in and prayed for them that you might have an opportunity to share Jesus? Because Paul talks about not being ashamed, but being willing, not doing it insensitively and all that kind of piece, but being willing to share your faith and to share about Jesus and how much he means to you. You see, it's really important we get the motivation for it because people know if we think we're being like looking at people as if it's only to get them to hear something. People know if we've got a heart for them. People know if we've got a genuine connection and genuinely care. Paul in Romans chapter 9 verses 1 to 5 talks about how his heart is broken for his fellow Jews that he wants them to hear the gospel. You know, some of us have a particular place that's on our heart. Some of us have people that are on our hearts. Some of us know that when we're praying for people, there's a little tear in our eye because we know God's heart for them. The only way we can start sharing the good news of Jesus is to have a heart for people. You know, at the beginning of this year, we challenged you to be praying for five people, five friends and family. Why? Because you know them and you love them and you have a heart for them. We'd love you to be praying for them. Keep on praying for them. That's what we as God's people need to be doing because it gives us a deep compassion as we pray and as we care. And you know, as we pray and as we care, opportunities arise for sharing and talking. You know, we sometimes think it's a hard thing to live in a space. And yet Paul is wanting to say there is a beautiful thing when we go to a place and know whose we are, Jesus is, and know why we're there, which is just to demonstrate God's love, to share his good news in those spaces. Yes, there is everything else that we need to do in terms of work and everything else. But in each of those places, those places are transformed if you know that because you are there, the very presence of God is transforming that place around you. You see, you are called to be heralds of good news in those spaces. That's why Paul quotes from Isaiah 52, verse 2, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's verse 15. You know, you're a herald of good news. 
When a city was waiting for the answer from whether it was a battle or something else, the herald ran and spoke out the good news. The good news of Jesus. It's a beauty when they saw the runner coming with the good news. It's why in the armour of God it talks about the good news, the gospel, the feet ready to proclaim the good news. There is something beautiful about hearing good news. Who here doesn't want to hear good news? It brings joy and hope and life. In each and every space where you move, whether you like that space or not, whether it depresses you or not, whether you enjoy working or not, whether you enjoy whatever, you have an opportunity to be a herald of good news, to serve in that space, to demonstrate that God loves the people around you. That's the reality of it all. How can anyone preach unless they are sent? How beautiful it is. My bet is that when you pause and stop and reflect on knowing Jesus, you can but give thanks for the people who shared Jesus with you. How beautiful are those people? And how beautiful it will it be when you get to share Jesus with others. That's what Romans is about here. You know, I wonder whether you would dare, whether you might pray for an opportunity this week to talk about Jesus. To talk about him in your workplace, or in your home, or in your community, or in your school, or in your college, or in the nursing home, whatever it is. I wonder if we dare to pray that we have an opportunity to talk about Jesus. You know, we can talk about Jesus and it comes up in conversation from our own lives. But you know, there are plenty of other places in our society where we can talk about Jesus from, where we can have ideas of how to talk about Jesus. I'm just going to give you one this morning. Now, how many of you here still travel up to London quite often for work or for leisure or for other things? Great, quite a few of you have come up, right. How many of you know that they are renaming the overground lines now? Brilliant. How many of you can list them? Okay, so, a few of you can, you can go look them up. I want to tell you about one. I want to tell you about one, it's called the Mild May Line. And the Mild May Line is named after a small hospital, and as they've put... During the 80s and 90s, it was involved in the AIDS crisis. And it did many, many, many amazing pieces of work there at that time. But the history of this hospital goes back to 1877. And its motto was to preach and to heal. It was there as a hospital for anybody and everybody, and it had outreach works in the community, and it went out as far as the old Ford mission. There's the motto of it. That was its 100-year centenary. Throughout the hospital, it was known for sharing the good news of Jesus and demonstrating it in word and action. Do you want to know something else when someone wants to ask you about the mild may lie? That was its centenary. There was a little boy who cut the cake on its centenary. There you go. That's me. <laughs> that is me there cutting the cake. There. Throughout the hospital, that was um, 1977. Throughout the hospital, there were scriptures on the wall, there was daily prayer, and there was a space of just showing and demonstrating the love of God in the everyday. When my grandfather came back from running the hospital in Burundi, he ran it, this particular hospital, from 1954 to 1974, and there was a part of the League of Friends leading that and helping in that transformation in the 80s and 90s. If you put on the next picture, there you go, that's 1964. And you can see in the right-hand corner one of the verses on the building. And the guy on the right is my grandfather, Kenneth Buxton. You see, there are so many things in this world and in England that we can use to talk about Jesus. 
That's just one. So when someone talks to you about the new lines in London or you travel on them, you can actually talk about Jesus if you want. But the point is, I show you that, not just because we can now talk about Jesus, but the biggest question is, what is it you're going to do? You can pop the fixes down there. What is it that you're going to do to talk and share Jesus? Each of you has that amazing opportunity. Each of you has a space to be able to share about Jesus. Each of you has a space and an opportunity that the Lord is sending to you this week. So how are you praying for it? How are you praying for your five people? Are you asking for an opportunity to share the good news? This whole sermon series is about you knowing the good news, being able to share hope, share peace, share how God has saved us and how God gives us a new start. In the next few weeks, as in the book of Romans, we'll be actually looking at how we can continue to demonstrate the love of God in Christ Jesus, how we can grow in that. But the big question is here at the heart of this passage. You see, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And how can they hear without someone sharing, demonstrating, praying, and loving them? God has done it in Christ Jesus. But God in his spirit chooses you and me to transform the world around us. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's us having King Jesus, declaring Jesus is Lord, but not in a way of arrogance, in a way of gentle service that shares the truth and love of God in the spaces in which he sends us. So I just invite you just to close your eyes for a second. And we're going to respond in two ways. The first is, I'd love you just to bring to mind those people whom you've been praying for. And if the Lord hasn't yet given you a heart from someone, just ask him. For the Holy Spirit is here. It's as close as that. The Holy Spirit is here. He's living inside us. The Lord will show you the people. He might even bring a little tear to your eye, as I suggested earlier. Holy Spirit, just reveal those people for whom you long for us to have a bigger heart for. And then, why don't you think of the places that you're going to be this week? And I want you just quietly in this space to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to them. And I'd love you to pray for an opportunity to share Jesus in that space this week. Maybe how you are, maybe how you act. But above all, maybe an opportunity to actually talk about your faith. (coughs) About what hope in Jesus means. For the world will know as we share. The Lord will give us opportunities if we ask. We just need to be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have. So allow the Lord to lead you into the spaces you are. Family, schools, colleges, workplaces, homes, (coughs) whatever it is, shop down the road. And so Holy Spirit, as you are here, we ask that you will equip and fill us that you will give us a heart for others. You'll help us to pray for others. And that you will give us opportunities this week just to share you in those spaces. Thank you, Lord, that you choose us. Thank you, Lord, that you use us. Thank you for the places you've placed us. Thank you that you know us and understand us. And thank you that nothing will ever put us to shame. So help us to know such an assurance of your love and your presence and your power that we might demonstrate your love in word, deed, and just who we are by receiving and being the people of blessing in those places. Holy Spirit, continue to minister to us. And for those of us who need to either confess with our mouth or respond in our hearts, may you be speaking to us to know your love your grace, 
but above all, your transforming, saving power. And as we worship and continue in song now, may you continue to speak to us as we dare to dream and dare to think and dare to trust you in the spaces that your spirit leads us out to in this week. So just rest, and when you're ready, do join in and just continue to allow the Lord and his spirit to be speaking to you and sharing with you the opportunities that he's going to give you this week. Oh, my. 
Just a reminder if you thank you for joining us for worship this morning. We hope you had a, enjoyed our service, and we would love to see you again on, online or in person at one of our next services. We'd just like to finish by saying the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.